The Churches of Christ presents Speaking the Truth in Love, a program bringing you life's answers from the Word of God. Welcome to this program. We're so glad that you joined us. This program is brought to you by Churches of Christ in this area, and there will be a list of those at the end of this program. If you have a Bible question, we encourage you to contact or visit one of these Churches of Christ, and they will help you in your search for truth. What I want us to talk about today is a warning of falling. You know, there is a belief among many that once you become a Christian, you can never lose that standing. You can never lose your salvation. Is that really what Scripture says? And I want to start out in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 2. The book of Revelation, as we learn in the early chapter, in the first chapter in fact, was written to seven different congregations that existed in the first century in Asia Minor. One of those churches was the church at Ephesus. Listen to what Jesus says to them as recorded in Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So the message is repent and the reason the message is repent is because they had fallen. It is possible to fall from grace. It is possible to fall out of favor with God and to lose one's salvation. I want to read a quote to you that I have on paper here 
that was given by a preacher several years ago, and it will show you that this belief of you can't fall, the, the belief that once you're saved, you're always saved, is not uncommon at all. There are many people who believe it. So listen carefully to what this preacher told his audience. All the prayers a man may pray, all the Bibles he may read, all the churches he may belong to, all the services he may attend, all the sermons he may practice, all the debts he may pay, all the ordinances he may observe, all the laws he may keep, all the benevolent acts he may perform will not make his soul one whit safer. Now listen, and all the sins he may commit, from idolatry to murder, will not make his soul in any more danger. The way a man lives has nothing whatever to do with the salvation of his soul. Listen to that last phrase again. The way a man lives has nothing whatever to do with the salvation of his soul. Is that really what the Bible teaches? That I can be a Christian and live in whatever manner I want to live and, and do whatever I want to do and not be in danger of losing my salvation? Again, remember what we read there in Revelation chapter 2. You need to repent from where you have fallen and you need to do the first works. You've left your first love is what Jesus told that church. There are many Bible passages that people will use to supposedly prove this idea that once a person is saved that they will always be saved and they cannot lose their salvation. And I'll, I'll give you just a couple of examples here. John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And they say, well see, once you believe in Jesus you won't perish. That's not what that verse says. It says, whosoever believeth in him should not perish. It means he shouldn't, but it doesn't say that he won't. See, it does matter how we live. Another verse is found in John chapter 5. Listen to John chapter 5 and verse 24. Jesus speaking, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death unto life. And so that verse is used to say, well, see, once you become a Christian, then there's no way you can lose your salvation. There's no way that you can fall from grace. Another passage is just a couple of pages over in John chapter 10. Jesus is speaking to a crowd again. Listen to verses 28 and 29. And I give them, talking about those who follow Him, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. See. That teaches once saved, always saved, we're told. That teaches once you're a Christian, you can never lose it. Neither shall, they, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. One of the things that's so important to do when we study the Bible is when we come to a difficult passage, and I think this is a little bit difficult because the, the teaching is so prevalent that once you're saved, you're always saved. One of the most important things that we can do in a passage or in an instance like that is to simply slow down and look at the verses around it. What's going on? Who is speaking? To whom are they speaking? Why are they speaking this? So Jesus does say in John uh, chapter 10 and verse 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Well, the question is, who is the they? Okay, to whom is Jesus referring when He makes that statement? Listen to John chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. Now listen to verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. See, that helps me understand then what John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29 means. They hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. As long as we're listening to what Jesus says and as long as we're following Him, verse 28 makes sense. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. If I keep on doing God's will, if I obey Him and live faithfully, guess what? I will never perish, but I will have eternal life because what is required of me is to do the Father's will. But let me share with you another passage that is often used to say that, well, once you become a Christian, 
You can never lose that. You can never uh, fall from grace. You can never lose your salvation. 2 Peter chapter 1, and I'll just read verse 10 because that's the verse that is often used. Therefore, brethren, be, more, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Now, that's right, but we have to ask ourselves the question, what's being talked about? Why would Peter make that statement? Is he discussing something that would play into a person stumbling or not stumbling? as it says there in verse 10? Well, absolutely. In fact, when you go back to 2 Peter chapter 1 and you start reading in verse 5, he says, but for this very reason, give all diligence to add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance and so on. You have to keep building up as a Christian and adding these characteristics to your life he then says in verse 8, For if these things are in you and abound, notice, if these things be in you and abound, it will make you that you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. See, Peter's not saying that once you're saved, you're always saved. He's saying that once you're saved, you need to keep adding these Christian virtues to your life and if you do that, you won't stumble. But it's required on the part of the Christian to keep doing what God says do. So what does the Bible actually say? Is it the case that once you're saved, you're always saved? Well, we've looked at a few verses already, but there is so much more in Scripture. We're going to stay in the New Testament because there are so many passages that, that really answer this question. Can a Christian fall? Can a Christian lose his salvation? The first place that I want to go to discuss this idea is in Acts chapter 8. Up until Acts chapter 8, the gospel and the Christians had been in the city of Jerusalem. The church was growing greatly through those, first, uh, through those early months and years, but then persecution arose and we learn in Acts chapter 8 that the persecution was from the hands of Saul of Tarsus. He was wreaking havoc on the church, taking men and women into prison, and the persecution got so severe as you get to Acts chapter 8, listen to uh, verse 3. And Saul, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and, wisdom, men and women, committed them to prison. And then you get to verse 4. Therefore those who were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now that scattering, we read about that earlier in Acts chapter 8. They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem to continue their work, but the rest of the Christians went, they went away. The persecution was so severe. This man by the name of Philip, and we're introduced to him back in Acts chapter 6. Philip goes to the city of Samaria, we're told in Acts chapter 8 and verse 5, and preached Christ to them. He performed miracles that, that verified he was a messenger from God, and people heard his preaching, and they saw the miracles, and they believed in Jesus. And you get down to Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, and it says, But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. But there's one individual that stands out in this text, and we read about him in verse 13. Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. I suppose there are a lot of different directions we could go right here. Well, first of all, why was Simon baptized and why is his name pulled out of this context of the whole city of Samaria? Well, he's baptized because that was the Great Commission. You know, just before Jesus left the earth, he told his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believes and is baptized shall be saved and he who does not believe shall be condemned. Mark 16, 15 and 16. Matthew 28, 19 tells uh, Jesus told his disciples to to go in to the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. So when we read these accounts in Acts chapter 8, such as Samaria and, and other places, people are being baptized because that's what Jesus was teaching through His apostles and through men like Philip. Philip was not one of the apostles, but he was a Christian and he was preaching the gospel. So Simon was baptized according to Acts chapter 8 and verse 13. One of the things that we learn about this man by the name of Simon was that he was a sorcerer, according to Acts chapter 8 and verse 9. 
And the word sorcerer comes from a Greek word that means he was a magician. All right, he was a, he was a trickster, we might say. But he witnessed the true miracles that Philip was performing. He heard the preaching of the gospel, and he himself was baptized. And as you read here in Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 14, the two apostles, Peter and John, were sent down to Samaria to lay their hands on people so that they might receive the Holy Spirit. See, you could only receive the Holy Spirit if an apostle laid his hands on you. And we learned that right here in Acts chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. Well, Simon, from his background as a magician, he saw the power. He witnessed the true miracles, and he wanted that power. And he said, listen, guys, hey, I'll give you some money if I can have this power too. And notice what happens here. Acts chapter 8 and verse 20. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. The gift of God specifically was the ability to pass on those miracles. Only, only the apostles could do that. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Peter's talking to a person who had already been baptized into Christ. And now, your heart's not right in the sight of God. So what is this Christian told to do since he had sinned? Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart might be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Now let me ask you a question. If it is the case that a Christian cannot fall from grace, if it is true that once you're saved, you're always saved, what would have happened here if Simon said, no, I'm not going to repent, I'm not going to pray, and I'm not going to ask God to forgive me? Do you really think, do you sincerely think that Simon would have been right with God? Well, of course not. He needed to repent, and he needed to pray to God for forgiveness. Simon is not the only instance of this kind of thing happening. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is writing to the, obviously, to the church at Corinth, and he's giving them words of warning, but he talks to them about himself and how he would conduct himself in his Christian walk. Listen to 1 Corinthians 9, beginning in verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. So just reading verse 24, think about that last phrase. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Well, what that implies is you can run in such a way whereas you do not obtain this prize. Something to think about. Verse 25, And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate, self-controlled, in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we, the Christian, we're not seeking a, a physical crown to literally put on our head. We're seeking an imperishable crown. Verse 25, Therefore, now Paul talks about himself, therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ. I mentioned him just a bit earlier from Acts chapters 8 and 9 when he was known as Saul of Tarsus and he was persecuting the church. But we know there in Acts chapter 9 that he was confronted by the Lord. He was baptized by Ananias as, a, uh, as recorded in Acts 22, 16. And he began preaching immediately in the synagogues that Jesus is the Christ, according to Acts chapter 9, verses 20 and 22. So Paul's a Christian. Paul's an apostle. Listen to what he says here. I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached unto others, I myself should become disqualified. You see, Paul understood very well that he could conduct himself in such a way as to lose his salvation. Now, think back to that quote that I read to you just a few minutes ago. The way a man lives has nothing whatever to do with the salvation of his soul. That's what men teach today. That's not what Paul taught, and that's certainly not what other scriptures teach. I'm going to turn over now to Galatians chapter 5. The book of Galatians is written, as we're told in the early verses, written to the churches of Galatia. And we read about them being established in Acts chapter 14. These are the churches of Lystra, Derbe, Iconium, and that area where Paul went early on in his mission works. Listen to Galatians chapter 5, and I'll begin reading in verse 1. 
Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor, a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law. You, listen to this, written to the multiple congregations in the region of Galatia, you have fallen from grace. And yet we're told by so many people today that you can't fall from grace, that you can't lose your salvation, that once you're in Christ, you can never fall out. Again, the book of Galatians is not written to individuals. It was written to entire congregations. We have letters in the New Testament like Timothy and Titus and Philemon that were written to individuals. This was written to multiple congregations telling them, if you're going to try to be justified by keeping the law of Moses and stressing circumcision, you have fallen from grace. So are we going to go with the people today who tell us that you can't fall from grace, you can't lose your salvation? Or are we going to study Scripture and understand that we can conduct ourselves in such a way so as to forfeit our salvation. We can give it up. Another passage I want to go to is in Hebrews chapter 6. The book of Hebrews is full of warnings of Christian faithfulness, full of admonitions and encouragement to keep on going. For instance, right here in Hebrews chapter 6, the author tells his readers, I am confident that you can do better. I'm confident of better things in you, things which pertain to salvation. He says in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 9. But listen to what he says a bit earlier in that chapter. Hebrews 6 and verse 4. He says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted of the good word of God and powers of the age to come. Listen to verse 6. If they fall away, but I thought we couldn't fall away. Because that's what so many people tell us. I thought we couldn't lose our salvation. That's not what Scripture says. If they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again to themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. Just like the book of Galatians, the book of Hebrews was written to Christians. And you have that phrase again, they can fall away, if you fall away. The Bible is so clear on this subject, and yet so many people believe something contrary, not just a little bit contrary, but in direct opposition to what the Bible says in terms of salvation. We can lose our salvation. So here's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to go back to Revelation chapter 2 where I started our study together. Revelation chapter 2, the first letter of these seven written to the seven churches of Asia, was written to the church at Ephesus, and just like with every congregation, Jesus says this, I know your works, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2. You know, we can't hide anything from Jesus. All things are naked and open to the eyes of Him to whom we must give account, according to Hebrews 4 and verse 13. We can't fool Him. And so, I know your works, your labor and patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and you have found them liars and you have persevered and have patience and have labored, labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. There are a lot of good things said about the church at Ephesus, aren't there? A lot of good things. But that's, th those are not the only things said. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. See, it seems what was going on was this congregation, they were doing the right things. They were doing good things. The problem was their heart was not in what they were doing. And that's a problem. I have this against you that you have left your first love. Listen to this phrase, Romans, uh, rather Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5. Remember therefore from where you have fallen and repent. Why would they need to repent if they hadn't fallen? And if you can't fall, why would Jesus say you have fallen and you need to repent? And so not only do you have all of that, he says, and you need to do the first works. You need to be like you, need, like you used to be because if you don't, he says, I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Well, the point is the congregation at Ephesus had fallen. 
and they needed to repent or they would lose their salvation. One last passage that I want us to consider is in Romans chapter 2, and it starts in verse 5. In Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3, Paul's discussing the issues between Jews and Gentiles and how they're all by the law of Moses condemned under sin, but now in Christ they can all be justified in the same way. And in Romans chapter 2, verse, beginning in verse 5, he's talking specifically to the Jewish audience there in, in the church at Rome, and he talks to them about God's judgment. Romans 2, 5, beginning. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. But as you read Romans chapter 1, you see that Paul is writing to saints, verse 7, Romans 1 and verse 7. And yet he tells them they can fall into the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each man according to his deeds, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality. Now listen, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, remember he's talking to saints here, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul who does evil of the Jew first and also to the Greek, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. So many people in our religious world believe that, you, that, that once you are saved, you cannot lose that salvation. Once you're in grace, you cannot fall from grace. And yet time after time we are told you can fall from grace or you need to repent and do the first works. Listen, you can be saved, but you can also fall. We need to be faithful and dedicated in our service to God so that we can maintain that right relationship with Him. Thank you. If you have a Bible question, would like to receive a free Bible correspondence course, would like a copy of two free books, please contact the Nettleton Church of Christ. Speaking the Truth in Love is brought to you by these area churches of Christ. Speaking the Truth in Love can be viewed online at Nettleton Church of Christ dot org.